Well, it's good to be back at Midweek Manor, isn't it? I trust that uh, your holidays are enjoyable in between. Uh, today, we're just going to uh, have a start off with a good vibe, right? We are at Acts 21. So this has been a long series, of course. Uh, most of you have enjoyed it. I trust that maybe all of you have. Uh, we're just trying different things, but we still are being committed to the fact that we need Bible study in our life. I, I'm, I'm always concerned about those that that just try to find a church service here or there, or even if they're regular in church service, there's still the importance of the individual getting into the Word of God uh, because we know that it is the living Word of God. It speaks to us every day. So if we're just waiting for a weekend message from God, we're just missing out on so much. So the daily walk, the daily bread, as Jesus referred to, is vital to us. Again, if you're just joining us, uh, all of these studies are archived, and so you're able to go back and take it at your leisure. Uh, maybe you want to go back because you uh, missed one week or... Uh, you just want to refresh yourself, they're all there. Let me also say that uh, for maybe the person that's just joining us, um, uh, this letter uh, in its original form uh, was just that, a letter, not a book. And, you know, as these individuals, in this case, Luke, writing, the Bible tells us that they were inspired as the Holy Spirit led them. Um, we have no way of knowing exactly if they felt that inspiration as they were writing on that papyrus. Uh, chances are they didn't. Uh, they just uh, were writing out of passion, out of desire, and out of the need to stay connected. In this case, uh, what we have in this original letter was a 30-year overview of Christianity from the pouring out of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost for, the again, the first 30 years of Christendom. What we've already learned up till now is that it obviously grew out of Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and for them, even in the first 30 years, they were getting into the uttermost part of the world. Now, the uttermost for us uh, uh, would come in time. However, where we are in this letter is now where the Gentiles are readily hearing the Word of God. What we've also learned is now Paul has created some incredible enemies, um, because of their position that um, the Jews were the custodians of the Word of God, um, and they wanted to keep it to themselves. They did not see the need for it to go beyond them. Uh, I'm going to do an addendum to that today as we uh, get into chapter, what we know as chapter 21, because we see now that wasn't the only position that these who were in opposition, but they wanted to make sure that they were in control. So with that being said, turn with me to Acts chapter 21, and we're going to read the first 16 verses um, as we see that Paul is intending to go to Jerusalem. The last time we were together, he was giving his swan song to many of these in Asia Minor. In other words, he said, it, well, he basically said, I won't ever see you again. He didn't think that he would, and in fact, he would not. So, verse 1 of chapter 21. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when 
we had come in sight of Cyprus. Leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another, another group saying farewell to. And then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. Now, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Tolos, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters, notice this now, who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since we would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nassan of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. So a lot of reading there, but again, let's, let's do a couple things we've done periodically through this study. And that is, this is Luke writing, thinking back, doing a review um, to an individual. Uh, an individual who, again, he was trying to keep protected, but also to inform this man of what had happened. Why am I bringing that up? Because think of ourselves writing a letter to someone to inform them. Again, we know we're well into the 30 years of review. If you have the responsibility, you know, here we are, uh, 2021, soon to be 2022. If you were asked to write a letter that dated back uh, to pre-2000, back to the 1990s, how good would we do? Can we remember what happened in 1995, 96, 99, Y2K, 2000. Again, that kind of just helps us to understand how, again, the Holy Spirit was guiding each writer. I am convinced that each writer was inspired, however, didn't know necessarily they were being inspired, that you and I, some 2,000 plus years later, would still be reading their letters that it would be translated in multiple languages by now, that because it was so important that it would be broken down by chapter and verse so that it had the ability to be studied, to be reviewed. 
So again, back to the intent of this original form of the letter. Luke is referring back. The point that I really want to bring out now, now that we've kind of tested ourselves, how good would we do, is today we're used to laptops, we're used to some kind of keyboard, uh, maybe even voice-activated equipment recording for us. But even if you and I were asked to take paper and a pen, it still would be arduous, right? Luke is writing on papyrus hmm, with ink. So the point is, not only do I need to remember what needs to be remembered, I need to be concise and terse about what I'm writing. I don't need to lose my, my audience, Theophilus, the lover of God. It, I, I need to write it like a historian. It needs to have validity. It needs to have content. It needs to have historical record in it that can be validated. At the same time, it needs to inspire. See, I just said a whole lot in one minute there that may help us as disciples today to get even a greater appreciation of what's before us. Again, as we're now reading just 16 verses of this 21st chapter, and it's more of a lengthy reading than we're used to. Because let's, let's face it, many of us, if we have a devotional life, we're reading a verse or two. We may be people that I want to read a chapter a day. Some of us will take it beyond that. I'll read a chapter a day, and I will actually journal it. So I'm remembering the way I remember the best. Some of us are doing this because I'm going to share it with somebody else. With all that said, here we are, and we're finding out what ports they're going to. Why is that important? I mean, if you're trying to just remember the, the juiciest part of it, that See, because the journey has to be included in how this thing is unfolding. The task that should be speaking to us, because many of us get weary in the mundane. We get weary in the responsibility of life as it comes to us on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis responsibility. Whatever your occupation is, or even if you're retired, the things that you're given to. Again, we're, we're feeling this now uh, as Paul is traveling. He's committed to go to Jerusalem. And now to pick up where he is, Paul is resolute. I'm going to Jerusalem. Well, not only now, is he having individuals come to him that are concerned for his welfare, that does not want anything to happen to him? Can we relate? Sure, we can relate. I mean, we're still on a good vibe, right? We're not, we're not having a downer. We're not having a blue day. But we don't want to have a blue day. Paul, we want you to stay with us. Why don't you just camp out here? Look at the good you've done. But here's something in his heart. And to me, honestly, out of the book of Randy, it, it, it's almost like there's a gyro in his spirit that I'm not saying that, that he had no mind at all, that he's getting dreams every night of stepping out uh, every, every part of his journey. No, no, no. And yet, it is this thing in him that the Holy Spirit's put in him. There's an assignment that I have to fulfill. But notice again, it isn't just opinions now. It isn't just friends who I want to keep you to myself or at least want to keep you protected. He's having people actually have God-ordained experiences that are warning him. Pay close attention. 
Is God confused here? I know what you're thinking. Pastor, why would you say something like that? Well, we have Paul who's being driven to get to Jerusalem, and yet now we're finding biblical language <laughs> that he goes into a home and the four daughters are all prophesying. And now a prophet Agabus comes and gives him a visual. I'm going to take your own leather girdle and bind it on my feet like I'm being shackled, like I can no longer walk where I want to walk. And he's showing him, this is what's going to happen to you when you get there. And yet Paul isn't having any of it. I'm going on. You're not going to change my mind. Now, there's a couple of things that I, 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 I want to bring out here before we move on is sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit of the growth that's happened in our individual life. Now, I'm not talking about being conceited here. I'm not talking about getting full of ourselves. What I am saying is that we're supposed to grow, that we're supposed to mature, that we're supposed to develop. Why am I saying that here? Because look at the language of chapter 21 versus what we first found out. There is now a church of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the planet, and it isn't just in Jerusalem. It isn't just in northern Galilee when Jesus speaks to those disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah reincarnated. Some say you're Isaiah reincarnated. But it is Simon Peter stands up, you are Christos, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And Jesus looks at him and said, yeah, and it's, it's upon that revelation that I'm going to build my church. They're hearing the language that you and I are so common with today. It hasn't materialized yet. They're just a band of followers to a rabbi, and that wasn't any new thing back in that day. Here we are now, 20-some years past the outpouring of the Spirit in Jerusalem. And now we are seeing maturity in people we don't even know their names. They're just four daughters. We get Agabus's name. And so, again, we, we got to appreciate what the Scriptures is speaking to us here at Grace Life Church or any church that is following the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to grow. And there are those people that do get names in congregations, and there's others, they are there, and they are being used of the Spirit of God, and we never know their name. It's the same thing today. It's the same principles today. See, don't you love Bible study? How it speaks to us. We're not just gathering and garnering information so that we can compete with somebody else or impress somebody else or teach somebody else in a healthy way. It is even more than that. You know, let's get back to the goodbye. It is about us being prepared. It is about studying to show ourselves approved. It is about now the Holy Spirit being able to raise up some other young women who will prophesy, some other young men who will prophesy. And so, again, there is now evidence of a truly spirit-led church that's no longer just a single congregation in any area. These are individuals, and now it makes sense, doesn't it? Why do we go talk about this port? Why do we talk about this? Because everywhere they're going, there's opposition, but there's also health. Same thing for us. Same thing for us. So, as we look at this, we see that Paul is resolute. You see other individuals who are used in spirit gifting warning him. So there really isn't a contradiction, is there? The truth is they were spot on in the prophetic voice 
Paul, you're walking to your demise. You're going to be hurt. Paul didn't deny it, did he? And yet he's driven. Is he just being a hard head? Is he just being stubborn? Is he just being mulish? No, he's being driven. Because now we find evidence of his own language. He said, I am ready. I'm ready to be incarcerated. I'm ready to die. I've got to get there. Man, it's just good stuff. It's just good stuff. Let's move on now as we read verses 17 through 26. So when he had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. Well, maybe it ain't going to be that bad. On the following day, Paul went in uh, with us to James. Now, James is the Mac Daddy. He's the pastor of the Jerusalem church. This is the brother of Jesus, not the son of Zebedee. So we went in he, uh, with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles. See, this we've had these meetings in the past, so here we are again, uh, through his ministry. Verse 20, and when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you and that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Uh oh. Telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. Wow. Get ready. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. See that Nazarite vow again. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observation of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. <laughs> then Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. So, a couple of important things here. You and I, in our Bible study today, we are so enamored with the name Paul. I mean, he is the criminal of the crim. He is <coughs> the ultimate. Here again, look what's happening to him. <coughs> Excuse me. He is going back to give report. I've got to get to Jerusalem. All this work that's been done among these Gentiles, it will all be for naught if I don't get back to the group who sent me. We know that Damascus became the, the hub of, for Gentile work, it is there in Syria where we are first called Christians. We see now the language back in Jerusalem. They're still very much concerned and more so about the Jews. And now we number in the thousands. And what we're hearing is this Paul has gone rogue. He's teaching them to dismantle what we've known that he's going into the Jews and telling them no longer to circumcise their children. Our customs, 
So we're telling you, we're sending four men with you. You're going to spend the days of purification, and you're going to pay their expenses to do so. In other words, we don't have a stipend for you. We're not paying for it. You're going to do it yourself. Do you see any rebuttal out of Paul? No. Now, we're going to read a little bit more. I'm not going to get ahead of us. What I do want to bring out here is simply this. Do you see how submissive he is? We don't see him bowing up, hey, I can take this thing and build my own church. I've got all these Gentiles. Forget you Jews. He's not doing that. Man, there is so much here that we need also to embrace today of the importance of it's still the Lord Jesus Christ's church. It's not Randall Brooks's church. It's not your church. It's his church. And the responsibility that we bear as we go through, well, I'd I just like to read this portion of Scripture. I want to take this section out. We see this struggle. We know the Gentiles have grown exponentially. There's a concern about that. But the biggest concern is, are you teaching other Jews to walk away from what we've known? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I have not come to condemn the law. Rather, I've come to full Philip. This is now Paul's role as well. So what we got to be reminded of, the scripture tells us to be subject to those who are over you in the Lord. That's not an easy thing sometimes. You know, we just, I don't like what pastor said. I don't agree with what pastor said. Well, you know what? Pastor is an old fossil now. He hasn't kept up with the times. Or a, a lady pastor and, and, and throw her under the bus. Of course, you all know I'm a bus driver, and you know my, my motto now. You can't throw me under the bus. I'm the driver. <laughs> no, what we're trying to teach here is to remember this wonderful model. Paul's come to give report, and he is being subject not only to give report, but as they put responsibilities on him, he does not fight it. He honors it. And, of course, he knows that he's not guilty of the charges. So we can talk about rumors, can't we? Oh, my, the rumors. Oh, well, we heard Paul's doing this. We heard Paul's doing that. And you know there were people there ready to receive his report, and they were rejoicing. And this is wonderful news, Paul, but there had to be some others like, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't here in the first meetings. I, I'm just hearing what others are saying, and I don't like it. And remember, there's been these Jews following him, desecrating everything he's building up, attacking him. Well, that word gets back to Jerusalem as well. So we need to know what's really going on. The last thing I'll say here before we go on and finish out the study today is about not only being subject to those over in your Lord, but about having conviction. You know, about uh, being faithful to what God has given you. There are some things that have a shelf life to them. I just had this discussion with one of my brothers yesterday. As now we know our father has gone home to be with the Lord, and this brother doesn't know much about his baby brother as far as my daily responsibilities. He can't identify with being a pastor of a local congregation for a lot of years. And as we're talking about what we learned as children in the home we were raised in versus now the responsibility we bear in the homes that we are priests over, and the things that were so valuable that were ingrained in us versus things that were just there. And for the times, they were fine. But do they stand up to the acid test to time itself? 
That's why we must have a personal relationship with our God and be led of the Holy Spirit. There has to be that thing within us that says, I, above everything else, I know the Lord, and I hear his voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life. There have been times in my life I have been prompted to do things that those closest to me did not understand at the time. And, and it's emotional. And you have to check all the boxes yourself. And Am I just being selfish right now? Am I being pig-headed right now? Am I doing what's convenient right now? But when you come to those convictions, now this is, this is the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life. Sometimes you get the privilege of others around you championing you on. And other times there are people, I'm very concerned about you, or I don't understand you, or I'm opposed to what you're doing. Can you stand the ground? Paul is this great example of being submissive, at the same time being led of the Spirit, of, of knowing that he has a mantle upon him, a calling upon him, that others can't understand, others who've come along the way in the process who now lean toward how it happened for them and they have no idea about those before them. I'll take just another moment here as I pastor this congregation and we believe in being generational or multi-generational. It's a challenge when you have those that are old enough to be grandparents to some here, and sometimes it's also the maturity rate of a believer. Many of these have been serving the Lord for many years versus someone just getting started. Sometimes it's not always that way. You got somebody that's very young in, in natural years, but they've been serving the Lord faithfully now for a number of years, and it may be someone older in years in life who are just rededicated themselves or born again, period. And, um, it's trying to get that place of understanding one with another and yet being true not only to yourself, that doesn't ring totally good enough in our hour of, of selfishness, but being true to the God that redeemed you and spoke to you and has been watching over you. And there are those things that I love Philippians 2 and 12. Work out your own salvation. But that's not the whole verse, is it? With fear and trembling. In other words, for me, I'm not saying everybody else has to do it this way because it's not one of those things to find perfectly in Scripture that says, thou shalt do this. But for me, this is what I've got to do. It aligns with God's Word as I understand it and I want to be pleasing to him. There are other things other people get involved in and you question because you've never been a part. And you look at it honestly and you say, I don't see any violation to scripture. So even though I've never done it, I've always had a bias against it. Guide me, Holy Spirit. Make sure I'm not bowing to something that I should. And you may find out that some of those things were good for you at one time but it was the first season. And then there are other things that now you're looking at others and you say, yeah, I don't see violation, but for me, it just wouldn't be right. And see, you're not going to hear that a lot of times because it's so involved. It's not just lying out there plain. It, it is that relationship. It is the Holy Spirit guiding us with conviction. So we're going to finish out now as we read verses 37. Um, actually, uh, we're picking up verse 27 through 36. Uh, we'll read it a little quicker. And when the seven days were almost completed, uh, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, uh, they stirred up the whole crowd. Uh-oh, things are getting bad now. And laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, 
help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Tromiphus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed him, crying out, away with him. So again, we see the story unfolding, what's happened many times. Again, those who had prophesied to Paul, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. They're going to hurt you. It's not going to go well. But he knew he had to go. He got to Jerusalem. Things looked to be great. They rejoiced in the reports. But now we need to put four with you and you need, because they're going to be your your. Your ambassadors, if you're genuine, true, you know, explain to them. But before he got a chance to go through the process, here he is, the mob, and now coming out of Asia, see, everywhere Paul's been, good and evil has happened, and here they come in, and I mean, they got the crowd against him, didn't they? And before they knew it, they had lathered the group up, and they're beating him and dragging him out, and intended to kill him. And it's only the Roman soldiers Again, remember, they're in Jerusalem. They're at the Temple Mount. You've got the temple, but you've also got Fort Antonio there. And they're coming down, and the Romans are going to squash any kind of uprising, any kind of mob rule. But they don't know who this Paul is, that he had been Saul. They don't know any of that yet. And so, again, everything that had been prophesied is true. He is being bound with change, just like, remember that leather girdle? It's fulfilled. And, of course, they're accusing him of treason. So let's conclude now as we read verse 37 through 40. As Paul was brought to be, excuse me, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian, then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the Assaians out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, and we're going to stop right there. But again, look at Paul and then look at yourself. He's being persecuted. He's being abused. He's being accused of things he was not party to but we don't see him upset. He's just been beaten. We don't know if he's bleeding in this moment, Swell, swollen, but he turns and he speaks to this tribune. And, and are you not? No, I am Saul, Paul of Tarsus. You know Tarsus and how fluent. So he's setting the stage that we're, the next time we, study together, we're going to see what is being said. But, but notice again, the Holy Spirit watching over Paul, 
driving him there, others sensitive, getting some of the information, what's going to happen, as if Paul didn't know, but then Paul reminds, I, I'm prepared. I know what you're saying is true. He's there. He's received graciously. They're going through the proper ways to support what's happened in the work of ministry. But before he gets a chance, they mean to take him out. He is being protected even though he's feeling pressure. Remember, we are pressed on every side, yet not crushed. So as we close today, we don't know what we're going to face today or tomorrow. What we must know is that we are resolute, that we will stay the course, that we will be faithful to the Word of God and have such a relationship that the Holy Spirit's able to put those convictions in us that causes us to fulfill our responsibilities until those responsibilities are done. Let's pray together. Thank you again, Lord. And, and we're finding ourselves in this study time almost feeling like, oh, we've put this thing on pause, and yet we've, we have looked over several things. And what we're identifying with are things that Paul was going through on a, on a daily responsibility. And Luke knew it was important because there's going to be other people reading this report. And were those other people, some of them. We've got to stay the course. We've got to stay resolute. And sometimes it comes with costs that we didn't really know the fine print of. And yet, even though we are pressed, we won't be crushed. We may, we may be cast down, but we won't be destroyed until the work is complete. So today, Lord, I trust that each one listening will say, here I am, Lord, use me. Give me the words to say. Give me the strength to last through the heat of the day. Help me to be mature to where you can call on me instead of just always being drinking the milk of your word. Let me be mature to where I can handle the meat of the word as well. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Until next time, keep a good vibe going.